This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're joined now by the band Sin Kane, led by the Sudanese-American musician Ahmed Jalab. The influential music site Pitchfork described Jalab's music, saying, if any artist deserves to swerve around a borderless earth with a real-world passport, it's the London-born Sudanese artist Ahmed Jalab. Listen to his catalog under the Sincane moniker, and you'll hear fragments of sub-Saharan pop, shoegaze, Afro-rock, electronica, krautrock, and everything in between, all melded into his own funky blend. Ahmed Jalab also heads the Atomic Bomb Band, which pays tribute to the legendary Nigerian funk musician William Onyebor. Sincane's latest record, Life and Livin' It. Well, today, Ahmed Jalab and Sincane join us here on Democracy Now! as they perform in our studio uh -huh. Welcome to Democracy Now. Thanks for having wow, me. Wow, that was great. Thank you so much. So I'm glad you think things are going fine. Uh huh. <laughs> well, <laughs> talk you know, about that song. You know, um, I think that people like me, and I think the the rest of the United States, uh, needs some sort of inspiration. You know, and um, uh, I think that uh, what I really wanted to say is, you know, times are tough right now, but it's always been that way. You know, uh, you can talk to any person from any generation and they'll tell you about the tough times during their time, you know, and um, what I've realized is we've gotten through all of that stuff. And the reason why is because we've always had hope. And I think that it's important for me to have that um, hope for people who are like me, who are dealing with stuff and also people who are discouraged right now. You say in the song, if we illuminate ourselves, we'll overcome. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Well, that, that's what I mean. I think that if we, if we have hope and we truly believe that things are going to be all right, you know, we will overcome through all of the tough times, through the darkness and through all of the, the terrible things that we're reading in the news, you know, um, and we need to stick together as a family, as a community, as, as people who uh, want things to be better. How did you choose your band's name, Sincane? Sincane is a, is a misheard word, actually. I, I was listening to a lot of Kanye West when I started the band, and there was a song of his called Never Let Me Down on his album The College Dropout. And in the song, there is a lyric that says, I want to give us us free like Sincay. I misheard Sincay as Sincane, and I thought to myself, who is this Sin Cain? Who is this person he's talking about? He must be this monolithic African god who inspired the entire continent of Africa, whose story has been passed down from one generation to the next through folklore and brought over to the United States through the, the slave trade and so on. And I never thought to myself that I should look it up on the internet until many weeks later, when I finally did, I realized I completely misheard what he was talking about, and he was speaking of Joseph Sinke, who was a slave who, read, who led the revolt on the Amistad ship. And I had just finished my album, my first album, and I needed a name, and it was Google proof, and I figured maybe I'll just be Sin Cain. So talk about when you started Sin Cain, and talk about your band and what you represent. Um, I started the band in 2007, and 
it was right after a lot of other bands that I played in had broken up for one reason or another. Um, I needed to uh, do something musical, you know, that's what I've always wanted to do my entire life and I couldn't really live without it. And um, I, I thought to myself, what if I explore all these ideas and these interests that I have? I've never really been able to do that on my own. Um, maybe I should just do something that's all ultimately mine. Um, and so I, I called a friend and I asked him to record this music that I, that I'd made. And through that process, I realized I was learning a lot about myself and who I really was. You know, as, as a, a first generation American who came in from Sudan, um, living in the United States and also going back to Sudan and living there, um, I had a lot of issues with identity and who, who am I? Am I American? Am I Sudanese? And through this project, I've been able to really explore my identity and understand my duality and really have like come to peace with my duality. And uh, along the way, um, my bandmates have also had the opportunity to do the same, you know, and we, w this band has become the ultimate testament of the American dream. We're all dreamers, you know, all of us come from many different walks of life, many different places from uh, the world in the United States, you know, and we are tied together by this music that we really feel and we see ourselves in. So it's been a really amazing uh, experience for me understanding who I am and coming to peace with my duality, but it's also been the the greatest showcase of of America to the rest of the world you know we are we are um, a, a people who are who are colorful you know when we inspire through that you know when you can see us all coexist with one another and be excited and play this music that we love and um, just be inspired by one another talk more about where you were born who your parents were and how you came to the United States and where you came from okay um, I was born in London, England. My dad was a diplomat working for the Sudanese embassy there. Uh, and we soon moved back to Sudan. Um, we lived there for about five, six years. And in 1989, the current leader of Sudan now, Omar al-Bashir, overthrew the government through a, a military coup. Um, and my father was affiliated with the government and we happened to be in the United States while he was studying and we gained asylum here because a lot of his friends would, were disappearing or being killed. Um, and so I, I came here when I was five years old, thinking that it was just going to be one year and we're going to go back to Sudan. Um, and we stayed when we had to start all over. My parents went back to school and um, we moved from one place to another. And after a couple of years, my mother and my sister and I would go back to Sudan and visit our family in Sudan every summer. So I'd spend three months out of the year in Sudan, come back to the United States for school. And it really kind of shaped who I am, you know, and it, it's a lot, it, it was a very confusing time growing up because I didn't know where, my place in the world as an American or as a Sudanese person. You know, I'd go back to Sudan and people wouldn't really accept me as a fully Sudanese person because I didn't live there and I'd be in the United States and people wouldn't really understand who I was or what my identity was because I wasn't fully American. Um, but, you know... Do people respond to you um, differently as African-American versus African? Do you see a difference there? Yes, absolutely. Well, I, I don't see much of a difference, you know, because I, I feel like I connect with many different people from all over the world, you know, because I've, I've been able to travel a lot and experience the world, and it's allowed me to experience the world with an open mind. You know, I, have, I never lived anywhere for more than four years until I moved to New York almost 10 years ago. So I, w I grew up meeting a lots of different kinds of young people who lived in many different places all over the United States, whether it was Africa or the United States or, or, uh, or the UK or wherever I was. Um, and it, to me, I, I saw similarity in all these different people. We all experience things in the same way. Uh, we all uh, love and uh, hate or, or feel nostalgic or sad, sad in, in a similar way, you know, and um, when we connect to things in a very, viscerally in a very similar way. But a lot of people didn't understand me because I wasn't quite like them, you know. Uh, whether it's some of, some of my white friends or some of my African-American friends growing up or um, some of my Sudanese friends, you know, there are a lot of different people who didn't quite understand it. 
I want to go back to Ahan.、Uh-huh. Um, you so smoothly move from English into Arabic and back, and I want to play a little more of the song、uh, and the Arabic. We've always been all right, and kulushi tamam, kulushi tamam, u kulushi tamam. We're all gonna be all right. We're all gonna be alright. We. 
grandfather, mm -hmm. his music, and talk about how it influences you. My grandfather, Tajisir um, Ali Sheikh, uh, he was a really famous and well-respected Muslim cleric in Sudan. Um, he had a, a mosque named after him and uh, would have these really great Sufi gatherings in Sudan centered around the, the birth of the Prophet Muhammad or, or other religious uh, um, holidays. Uh, and he, he, him with a few other people would recite uh, religious scripture in this sing-songy way. There are a lot of Sufi rituals where there's a call and response where a person sings and then uh, the crowd responds or, or the people who you're you're um, doing it with will respond back to you. Uh, as a kid, I would go to these, I would be in Sudan and go to these, and I would have these overwhelming tantric experiences where I felt, I felt so moved by his, his uh, singing, you know? And I remember almost hallucinating at times, you know, feeling this overwhelming sense of joy and happiness and, and, and calm, you know? Um, and that really allowed me to understand spirituality in this really beautiful way. And I've been able to, uh, or I, I aim to take that feeling that I had and try to reappropriate it into the music that I do. You just recently, Ahmed, went back to Sudan, as you do, but you went with your whole band. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that experience? I, it was the greatest musical experience I've ever had, and I think it, it um, might have been similar to the rest of the band, you know. Uh, I hadn't been back in Sudan for 11 years, so this is the first time that I was able to go back there as an adult. And um, I had a few days before the band came to just hang out with my family and see uh, Sudan uh, a little bit. And once they came, we all traveled together to the festival. And for the Where first, was the festival? It was four hours north of Khartoum, the capital, in a small town called Karmakol, which is the hometown of Tayyip Saleh, who's a, uh, an author from Sudan. What it allowed me to do is see Sudan for what it truly was, you know. It's a, it's a country made out of many different kinds of people, you know. The, if you walk around in the marketplace in Sudan, you'll see many different faces, uh, many different accents, uh, many different kinds of people. If, and you travel from Khartoum, the capital, down to al uh, which is the, the capital city of the region Kurtufan, or you go up north in Karmakol, and, um, where, we, where we did the, the festival. There are many different kinds of people there, and the generosity and hospitality and just the, the, the vibrancy of everyone there is just so apparent and it's so exciting and um, I didn't expect to have a concert like that at all and people were so excited and so happy to be there and, and dancing and just showing a lot of love and uh, Sudan is a country made out of a lot of love and it was really exciting for me to experience that. Talk about how people respond to you as, um, for example, as you're performing. You talked about maybe feeling apart from Sudan when you're, they consider you there Sudanese-American or from Britain or born in Britain, but now you're this major performer coming back home. Yeah. I think that that went all out the window when we performed. You know, people were just so excited to, to be there and so excited to enjoy the experience with me, you know, and I was excited to join the, enjoy the experience with them. And I really, truly felt at one with everyone, not just the people of Sudan, but my band. You know, we were all there to represent uh, ourselves as this this entity, you know, that like kind of transcends uh, the the identity that you have to be one kind of person. You know, we we all kind of like feel ourselves in this music and just uh, allow ourselves to be at one with everything around us. You know, and um, in Sudan, I felt I really truly felt that. Life and living it is your latest album. Why would you call it that? I mean, the songs are very autobiographical. They're all about. The experiences that I've had growing up. I think the more that I write music, the more I'm influenced by experience and uh, things that I've dealt with or things that my band has dealt with or we've collectively dealt with that we relate to that we want to write music about. 
Um, and ultimately, I want to connect with people. Music, the Sin Cane is an opportunity for me to connect with people who are like me, who have grown up in a foreign place for where they're from um, and have the issues of identity like I've had, or people who just feel different. They don't have to be Sudanese or they don't have to be uh, non-American or whatever. They just feel different from from uh, society at large. And they they I just want to show people that they're not alone. There are a lot of people like us, and you can come to a Sin Cane show and be uh, calm and be at peace with it. Introduce us to Favorite Song. Favorite Song is a song I wrote about an experience as a DJ. Um, I think a lot of people who DJ run into the situation where people come to them and ask them to play music for, you know, they, they say, well, you know, if you, if you only play this song, the whole place will explode and everything will, will be great. And I like to humor that and play the, you know, a lot of DJs won't, won't play uh, any requests, but I, I like to do it. And I remember a specific time playing that, playing someone's favorite song and the whole place kind of got excited, you know? It, was, it wasn't just this one person who liked the song, everyone liked it, you know? And uh, they all kind of like felt like they were floating and just in, in like this um, suspended uh, sense of, of happiness, you know? And I thought it'd be really funny to write a song about it, you know, and um, just further connect with that experience. Let's go to favorite song, St. Kane. Won't you take me to that place? See you. 
favorite song My favorite song Play my favorite song Won't you play my favorite song My favorite song Play my favorite song Sudanese-American musician Ahmed Jalab singing favorite song from their latest album, Life and Living It. You talked about your grandfather, who was a Muslim leader in Sudan, um, but you were heavily influenced by someone else as well. Um, yeah. Talk about William Anyebor and what he has meant in your life and um, how you're trying to spread his music as well. When I was about 23, years old and I was starting Sin Cain. Um, I was really trying to figure out a way to transcend the idea of the music where I came from and the music where from the, and also the music from America that I was trying to meld together. I wanted to transcend this idea and, and make something that I felt like I truly related to a mixture of African and American musics together or music from all over the world that inspired me and I, I just didn't know how until I listened to his music. Um, I was introduced to his music through a, a compilation called um, World Psychedelic Classics Volume 3 Love is a Real Thing where a song um, Better Change Your Mind was on and it was the first time that I had heard music that melded the idea of American songs and African songs together and it truly transcended both of them and created something very unique and I really related to it I could feel the Africanness of it or I could feel the Americanness of of it all and it allowed me to take that inspiration and bring it into my music for a minute let's go to William Anyebor's um, Better Change Your Mind America do you ever think this world is yours change your mind. America, you ever think this world is yours? And you, Russia, hey, you ever think this world is yours? China, you ever think this world is yours? Cuba, you ever think this world is yours? So you're hearing this song, it changes your life, and you ultimately go to meet him in Nigeria? Yeah, um, 
two years ago, I went to his house, spent three days with him in his house, and it was an amazing experience. I think that when you hear people talk about meeting their idols and they have these like over the top stories, it's kind of hard to connect with them until you actually have one of those experiences. And that was definitely one of those. Where did he go? Where does he live? He Where lives did in he Inugu, live? Nigeria, in this gigantic palace way out in the bush, completely like maybe a 45 minutes away from the city. This is in southeastern Nigeria. Yeah, yeah. It's, it was amazing. It just the, the trek getting there alone could, could be a story. But when we got to his house and just hearing his, his stories and um, his persona, his larger than life persona, it was really amazing. And explain who he was, because in fact, he never performed. No. He, this was a recording we were listening to. Yeah. William Anibor, uh, in, uh was a businessman. You know, he, he was a very creative and very intense kind of businessman. And in, in the late 70s, he wanted to get into the music business. And so he, he started out by wanting to, rec to, to make a movie and write a soundtrack to a movie. He never made the movie but he wrote the soundtrack. And that kind of led him to this eight album journey of, of recording music. Um, not only did he record the music uh, himself, he recorded in his own music stu studio, state-of-the-art music studio in Inugu, Nigeria, with all of this amazing gear that he had found uh, from all over the world. He played a lot of the instruments himself, and he released all of the music himself on his own record label and pressed all of the records himself in his own record plant. This is something that's way, way ahead of his time. You know, even to this day, you won't find someone who is that full in to uh, the experience of, of making a, a record, you know, and let alone eight records, you know. So it, it's a pretty unbelievable thing that he did, you know. And even when we were there, I, I saw, like, remnants of his studio and his record plant hanging out all around his house. It was pretty amazing. So he was a also a Christian leader. He built a church. Yeah, so in, in 1985, he stopped playing music and just uh, became a devout uh, Christian. I mean, he, I think he was always religious, but in 1985, he really uh, just kind of gave himself to, to Jesus. And he... Um, he had his own church, and he would he would talk to us about it a lot, you know, um, and that was that became his focus from that point on until his, he passed away last year. So, talk about Atomic Bomb Band and what it does. So, the Atomic Bomb Band is led by me, and the core of the band is my is the Sincane Band: Johnny Lamb, uh, G Jason Trammell, um, Ish Montgomery, and me were the the core of the band. Um, Luaka Bop asked me to put the band together and uh, said that they were David Byrne and Damon Albarn and Money Mark from the Beastie Boys were so were ex interested in being in this band but they needed me to to lead it so uh, me and the boys we got together and we learned all of his music we dissected everything inside and out and practiced for hours on end to get ready for this all-star cast of musicians that wanted to perform with us um, originally we were we were told we were just going to do six shows, but it kind of turned into a thing unto itself. You know, we, it's been an opportunity for me and my band to play with all of our idols. You know, we played with Pharaoh Sanders, who's one of the reasons why I started the band. We played with Charles Lloyd and, um, like I said, Damon Albarn and Jamie Lydell and Luke Jenner from The Rapture, and the list kind of just goes on and on and on. All these amazing people that we've been able to play with. And it's been a really amazing experience for me to see the music of William Wanderbor connect with so many different people, you know. So let's go to a, your Atomic Bomb band featuring Sing Kane, David Byrne, and others performing Fantastic Man by William Wanderbor on The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon.
you Ahmed were playing synthesizer there, and then you had the Lajadu sisters, uh, the Nigerian singers. Talk about them. Uh, the Lajadu sisters were a pretty amazing, uh, you know, twin uh, musical group from Nigeria that had a lot of prominence in the 70s and the 80s. They were exiled from Nigeria and moved to the United States, to, to New York, actually, um, and hadn't performed in a long time. Um, when I was originally asked to do the project, I, I asked the, the label Lawakabop if, if there was any way to get a hold of them. Their, their music had been gaining some uh, resurgence, you know, like they had a pretty big cult following, and their, the Knitting Factory Records was reissuing some of their music. And so we got a hold of them. They lived. They still live in New York. And um, I went over to their house and talked to them about about uh, performing with us. And it was an amazing experience as well. They're such characters, and they kind of turned into our our mothers, you know, throughout the entire process. And you performed uh, William Neador's music in London for the first time ever. It was being performed live. Yeah, the Barbican. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. I want to go back to your songs um, uh, that you have written, like Mean Love, mm -hmm. and give us the background of that. Uh, mean Love is the title track from my previous album, um, and me and my uh, music partner, Greg LaFaro, who I write a lot of my songs with, uh, with that album, we wanted to kind of uh, relate the sentiment of love, but without talking about loving uh, things like you'd regularly hear in a song, you know, loving a person, um, another person. And we uh, wanted to write a song about the experience you have and the relationship you have with yourself. So we wrote this song using a lot of musical tropes similar to a lot of doo-wop or uh, things that people are, uh, fam are familiar with, but we wanted to write a song that was not about the stereotypical relationship that you have. And so. That's how that song came about. This is Sin Kane performing Mean Love in Democracy Now! Studios. Just cause you show up every day Doesn't mean that I think you'll stay You know I love you, but 
Now, studios. Our guest today is Ahmed Jalab. Uh, he is the founder of Sin Kane, the lead singer, a uh, musician who um, has been traveling the world with his music. Um, let's talk about the world and this time, this era of Trump, mm -hmm. President Trump calling Africa these s-hole mm -hmm. countries. Talk, talking about it as a country, of course, not talking about it as a uh, continent. Yeah. So. You release your song, Life and Livin' It, right at the beginning of the Trump era. I mean, it was a few weeks after Trump was inaugurated, yeah. President Trump. Yeah. That was a really interesting thing. Um, uh, while I was writing the album, you know, I think a lot of people still didn't believe, like, that he was going to become president. And um, when I was writing the song, Aha, uh -huh, in particular, I wasn't really thinking about it as a response to the feelings everyone was having after he became president, but it came it came to be uh, some sort of anthem or some sort of uh, uh, calling, you know. After he became president, it was it, it it was completely by happenstance, and it gave the song new life, and it uh, kind of gave the image of the band uh, a lot more weight than uh, we had before, you know. Um, uh, the, the I mean, he's inaugurated Trump, mm -hmm. and within days he initiates the first travel ban, and yes. your country, Sudan, mm -hmm. is on the list. Absolutely, yeah. And it's called the Muslim ban, yeah. and of course you're Muslim. <laughs> yeah. Um, some of my cousins who've moved to the United States uh, were unable to go back to visit family. You know, um, one of my cousin's father passed away, and then the travel ban happened and he wasn't able to go see his family so I was directly influ or directly influenced by what happened um, and it, if anything it this time has allowed me to become more inspired to do what we do and to tour and to play and to show the world the image of this band and and show that we are Americans and look at us we're all very different kinds of people and that's what the real America is. And so what has it been like performing all of this through this year? There's not only the first Trump Muslim ban, there's ban number two, there's ban number three. And as you travel the country, do you feel um, any differently? Do you feel you're treated differently? Or do you feel you have different responsibilities now in an era of Trump? I, I definitely believe that we have a different set of responsibilities now. Um, I feel incredibly inspired to perform and to showcase the image of the of the band, not just me, of the band, because we we are all very different people and we come from very different places and we look very differently, but we represent the United States, the true United States, you know. And I I, I always say I'm I'm not gonna allow the image of the the U.S. to be this 
terrible kind of uh, scared place. You know, we we are colorful and we are op we, we we accept people with open hands and we represent hope. You know, um, and I don't necessarily we don't necessarily get treated differently when we travel to the United States, but people always ask us about the United States when we leave, you know? And as a representative of the United States, I think that it's important for us to showcase what it truly is, as honestly as possible, you know, this very colorful and beautiful place that accepts people from uh, any ethnicity um, and that is built from people uh, who come from many different places. President Trump's recent comments about Africa being a s-hole country, despite the fact that it's a continent, um, <laughs> uh, but I guess the real issue is the s-hole, mm -hmm. uh, the word that I'm not saying. What does that mean to you? And as you talk to people in Sudan and here and other countries in Africa, I think it's ignorance of what uh, what we who we are. You know, I mean, I think that a lot of people don't know much about Africa. You know, they uh, other than what they see in the news. I mean, a lot, a lot of people don't know much about Sudan at all. You know, and that's really unfortunate. And for me, what it means for me is just I I am now a representative of Sudan, and I it's my duty to show people what the culture is about and who we are. You well, know? talk about who you are. Talk about um, what we should know about Sudan. Sudan is a, a really beautiful place. Um, uh, it's one of the first countries to gain independence from the the British colonial power in 1956. Some people would argue it was the first, you know, to to gain uh, political power or to gain um, uh, independence. Um, it's dealt with a lot of issues, you know, in regard to uh, coups overthrowing uh, democracy. But um, the people of Sudan are very resilient and they're very colorful. They're made up of a lot of different um, indigenous groups, a lot of different languages a lot of different religions, and they all coexist, you know. Uh, as Sudan uh, st currently stands, you know, the, in 1989 there was a military coup um, that overthrew the democratic government by a man named Omar al-Bashir. He's currently still in power, you know, almost 30 years later, still in power. And in 1989, after that coup, four to seven million people fled the country. There's a giant brain drain. And what that, what's that, what that's amounted to now is 75 percent of the population of Sudan is 25 years old and under. You know, that's amazing. And when we went back in December, that youthful uh, energy exists there. There's a lot of young people doing a lot of amazing things, and they have the internet to see the rest of the the world and to see like what they're doing and it's amazing to me to go to a country where um, the price of bread is more than the common man can can uh, can pay for still have that much uh, resilience still have that much energy and that much uh, uh, creative creativity uh, to to live in such a, a impoverished situation um, when we played in Sudan we played near uh, the, what they call the Bajrawiya and, and Marawi, where there are a lot of pyramids. And there are more pyramids in Sudan than there are anywhere in the entire world. And it's a really beautiful experience to go see these, these uh, pyramids, the dawn of civilization, that predate the Egyptian pyramids by th over 3,000 years. You know, uh, There's a lot of history in Sudan. There's a lot of uh, beautiful culture, a lot of amazing music you know, that exists there. But because of sanctions and because of... Uh, um, uh, dictatorships, a lot of people haven't been able to experience that. But it's it's my duty to show the world all of that and to see the beauty within this, the terrible situation there. And what has happened since South Sudan became an independent nation from Sudan in 2011, um, sliding into civil war soon after that, the mm -hmm. oil-rich part of Sudan, four million people displaced by the violence? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a... It's a, it's a a, a place that's in shambles, you know. I mean, both north and the south are not in the the best economic situation right now, you know. But there are there is a lot of hope, you know. There's it's it's tough for a lot of people, but there's a lot of hope. Like I said, there's a lot of youth there, and the energy is is huge right now, you know. And a lot of people are just trying to, a lot of people are trying to get by, obviously, you know. But at the same time, there are people like me who have. Uh, been raised outside of Sudan who are Sudanese as well that are trying to, trying their best to make uh, people aware of the situation in Sudan in order for us to uh, make a better situation for everybody. Ahmed, do you ever think of returning to Sudan as a political leader? You're seen as a leader when you come back as a musician? I don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll have to see. Mm -hmm. 
So what are your plans now? You're cutting a new album? Working on a new record and just trying to connect with as many people as possible. Um, what is your new album focused on? Um, I'm uh, the duality, you know, the identity uh, that I have dealt with. Um, diaspora, you know, at large, a lot of people. Um, I'm a part of the second generation diaspora, the second generation African diaspora, and uh, my family came here willingly, and I lived in a place that um, uh, is foreign from where I come from, you know, and I think the term diaspora now is not the same as it used to be. A lot of people un feel the uh, the influence of diaspora who haven't dealt with it in the same way, you know. Uh, America is a very disparate place these days, and a lot of people kind of feel like they don't belong or they they live in you know some sort of alternate reality where where no one understands what their identity is you know and i want to i want to discuss that on a new record and i want to connect with as many people and bring as many people together one last critical question ahmed what's your favorite food my favorite food barbecue barbecue <laughs> of all things yeah now i thought you were going to say peanut sauce Oh, yeah, yeah. That's definitely my favorite food. I, I, I take that back. It's really funny. The, the, one nece the one necessity that we have on tour is to eat well. And our guitar player, Johnny Lamb, is, uh, we call him the, um, the ambassador of, of good things. Is that what it is? The ambassador of, of, a, of a, a holistic life on tour. And he always finds the greatest food for us on tour. So barbecue has been my my uh uh go to thing but i can put peanut sauce on anything and eat it with anything because i understand you're called the peanut sauce boss oh wow <laughs> wow that's really interesting that you uh, figured that out i mean yeah i'll take it that's well it. i did some investigative digging <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we aren't journalists here at democracy yeah. now peanut sauce is kind of a fundamental food in sudan you know um Hot sauce, the Sudanese hot sauce is made out of peanut butter. And one of my favorite foods from Sudanese food is called agache, which is uh, like a uh, chicken or lamb kebab that's pasted with peanut sauce marinade. So I've kind of, it's kind of been instilled in me from a very young age. Well, that about does it. Thanks yeah. so much for <laughs> spending the time bringing your band here and answering the most critical question. That, that is amazing. Ahmed Jalab is a Sudanese-American musician. Uh, his latest album, Life and Living It, but he's cutting a new one soon, uh, here with his band, Sin Kane. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.